Coming up, I look at the Sinclair Games Pack 1 to 5. I play some games. Jeff plays a next game. And I continue my chats with Alan. Let's get on then. When the Spectrum was released in 1982, there were games already available for the waiting public, but Sinclair wanted to showcase their new machine, and so released a set of four compilations to show the potential purchasers just what the machine could do. Later they released a fifth title in the series, but let's start with Games 1. The inlay is typical Spectrum, and does look good. However, the games are, well to be honest, rubbish. First up we have Martian Knockout, not a shoot 'em up but a simple trajectory game where you enter a value, watch a blob flubbed across the screen, and hopefully destroy some other blobs. Hardly a user-definable graphic in sight, and yes, written entirely in BASIC. The base moves each time to add a little bit of variety, but yeah. On to the next game, and this is Racetrack. Will this be a smooth, fast, pole position style? Uh, no, no. The screen scrolls up in character squares and you move left and right to avoid the sides of the road. Mm. Next we have Labyrinth. You have to get to the cache in the centre and avoid the guards. That's those asterisks there wobbling about. You have to avoid running out of water, in other words how many turns you take, and get out safely. For a type-in, it's fine I suppose, it's a good idea. Things only move once you move, so you can plan your path. And it's not as easy as it seems though. Finally onto the last game then, and we get Skittles. You select a row to bowl down, press 0, and watch your ball randomly move about once it hits the Skittles, all in glorious silence. Well that was games 1 complete, what do you think? Mm. Would you have thought the Specky was brilliant based on those? Let's hope Games 2 improves things. First is Galactic Invasion, and it doesn't even auto run. Oh dear, this is the same game as Mash and Knockout. On to Drop a Brick then, rather unfortunate title there, no auto run again, and it's a simple breakout game, no sound. Let's move on then. Silhouette Colour Doodle. Not sure this is classed as a game really. For those old enough, this is a simple Etch-a-Sketch like program. You can change the colour, but mm -hmm, okay. And last on the tape is Train Race. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. You pick a train, pick a colour, and watch a random race between three of them. Ah, right, okay. I think the most interesting part is putting your name in it. It's very slow, and hardly as exciting as the inlay would suggest. No use of user-definable graphics at all, and no sound. Come on, Blue! Oh dear, Green seems to be getting ahead. And green wins. Right then. On to games three. Let's keep optimistic here. Mind the meteors. Now we get some, well, well half decent early type in material, I suppose. Guide your ship across the screen and avoid the meteors. Not really meteors, they're just asterisks again. No sound, no auto run. <laughs> sort of fun to play. Next we have Daylight Robbery, a very apt title for this series of games. Now this is similar to Labyrinth, but the guard moves on his own. You collect the cash and avoid the guard. Challenging game, but again, not something that would show off the Spectrum's capabilities. Next we have Battleships, and we all know what's coming. Yes, you enter a grid reference and try to destroy the computer's fleet. 
Hmm. And finally, Invisible Invader. Here you guide an asterisk around the screen, using the hints about which direction to go to find the hidden invader. Not very challenging at all. Phew, well. Well, now we're on to the last of the 1982 tapes. Games 4. First we have Docking the Spaceship. Here you guide your letter O to try and dock. Now this is quite difficult because the movement is continuous and you have to keep stabbing the keys to try and get into the docking port. It's a bit annoying, but okay for a few tries I suppose. On to Journey into Danger. Ooh, this sounds scary. And actually, this is not a bad little game. You have to escape the maze populated with randomly placed monsters and treasure. If you meet a monster, you are told what chance you have of killing it, before opting to run or fight. Now this is the most rounded game we've seen, and I really enjoyed playing it, believe it or not. You can try and get as much treasure as you can and beat a score, or you can just try and get out. Now on to Invasion from Jupiter. Here you enter a number that seemingly draws a random line, with the hope that you hit one of the aliens. Now I couldn't quite work out the mechanics of this. Entering the same number three or four times draws a line at a different angle, so there's no consistency. Anyway, I hit a few invaders and uh, whoopee doo, nothing special. Time to move on. And lastly we have The Great Escape. Trapped in a cavern with a mindling monster from outer space. Yes, that's what the game states. You move around a small area, being chased by a mindling alien looking for a hidden escape hatch and avoiding the mines. Hmm, it's just another hidden thing game really with added aliens and mines. And that was the last game. But hold on, remember there was another one, yes, Games 5. Luckily this only had one game on it. And looking at the inlay, I think we all know what type of game this is going to be. The game is called Star Trail, and it's the only 48k game of the set. Once it's loaded, we get a little message that gives away the fact that it's based on Star Trek, not that you needed any guesses. You get a good manual, and I suspect, taking up more memory than the game does. And then the game begins. You guide your ship around the galaxy, manoeuvring and firing on enemy ships. I'm not a fan of this style of game, but I can see how it could be engrossing, especially for fans of the TV series. Well, that was it. Sinclair's offering to tempt people to buy a Spectrum. I suspect that the tapes were not put out as a good example of the power of the Spectrum. More a learning approach on how to use BASIC. But whatever the reason, you'll never have to see them again. Now that you know what's on them. This is Technocop, released by Gremlin Graphics in 1988. This was released on disc for the Plus 3, and this is the version I'll be playing. The game is a mixture of styles, taking you into the law enforcement of the future. Technology has overtaken society, the rich are getting richer, and the poor are getting poorer. That's what the inlay says, and it sounds just like 2021. There is chaos on the streets, and you need to sort it all out. And to do this you are given a car, a gun and a net. Your job is to capture, or kill, as many criminals as possible. And it all starts with a driving section. This is very much like road blasters. You drive along and shoot or avoid the other cars. Luckily though, unlike road blasters, the cars don't shoot back. As you drive along, you'll be notified that a crime is taking place, and eventually, as you get closer, 
a portrait of the criminal is drawn on your arm computer, and this will help you identify them once you reach him. You also get told at this point whether they should be caught dead or alive, and this means either using your gun or your net when you finally get there. There's a time limit too to get to the scene, so you have to be quick. This particular part isn't so good for you, the car handles fine, but it's just not inspiring enough, and serves only to get you to the next stage. Your car can be upgraded, making destroying the other cars easier, but really it's just best to avoid them. Eventually you'll get to the crime scene, and here the game turns into Joe Blade. Yes, you run around the corridors using lifts to get to other floors and try to locate the villain. You have a small radar on your wrist that shows where the criminal is. If you find them, you can shoot them or use your net, depending on your orders. Now I never managed to complete a mission, the villain always shot me first for some reason, maybe just not quick enough, eh? There's also a time limit to this, but if you don't find the villain in time, they just escape and the game continues anyway. This section has much better graphics, with some nice backgrounds and sprites, although they do look a bit cute for the setting of the game. Here various henchmen appear and throw axes or shoot at you. There are also members of the public wandering about for some unknown reason, so you have to be careful. Using the lifts is key to finding the villain, and they work quite well. Once completed, or failed, like me, it's back to the car for more racing. The 3D effect isn't too bad, and the sound is about average, but your gun does sound a bit rubbish. If the other cars bump into you, or you bump into them, this will cause damage to your car. The car does have a smart bomb, called Nukes, that remove all cars from the visible road, but you have to earn this, and I never managed to get one. I did, however, get another power-up, a Turbo Boost. Overall, it's a bit of a pedestrian game, really. It's a middle-of-the-road mix of driving and shooting with nothing special about the driving section. The second part with the platforms is better than average, I would say. The whole game as a thing is not terrible, but it doesn't excel either. This is XL, released by Activision in 1985. Many eons ago, 30 sentinel planets were set up to defend the Earth. Over time they were forgotten though, but their internal systems grew and became sentient, and now they want to take over the Earth. By this time no one has any idea how to fight them, but you steal an ancient spaceship from a museum and head off to try and save the world. The ship, being alien, has only been partly converted to English, so many of the controls are not familiar. But you're going to try anyway. OK, that's the story out of the way. This game is a shoot 'em up with two distinct parts. First, you navigate through a set of trees and blocks that's supposed to represent the planet's surface. The trees cannot be destroyed, but the blocks can. Once you get past this, you enter the shoot 'em up stage, a bit like Galaga or Gallagher, depending on how you say it, with swooping aliens. You can either shoot them all to clear the level, or wait for them to vanish. These two segments repeat three times per planet. At this point, if the planet has a sentinel base, it will be destroyed automatically. If not, it's back to the main menu to pick another planet to visit. Let's start with the good things then. The shoot 'em up section is fine. It works well and has just the right amount of difficulty. OK, that's the good bits. Now on to the not so good bits. The scrolling sections are a real pain and sometimes require pixel perfect movement. Sometimes they are almost impossible with trees that double back over themselves. Other times they are very easy. Once you clear a planet, you go back to the control center and here you can view a map of the planet, view other planets, and any communications. As you view the other planets, information about them is shown, however it's in gibberish, because it hasn't been converted to English, so you have no idea what it says. So really there's no point for them being there at all, it's just a waste of space.
And, of course, this means that you can either pick planets at random to visit, or just work your way through them slowly. When you pick a new planet to visit, you jump into hyperspace with a short sequence, which again is superfluous and not really required, and then it all starts again. Now, I'm not lying when I say I played this for nearly an hour solid, eventually reverting to an immunity poke, and I was bored with the repetitiveness of the gameplay. There's no variation, no hint as to which planet you should visit, and after an hour, I hadn't found a single sentinel base, and that was after about nine planets. I think a variation in gameplay or different graphics for each planet would make a big difference. As it is, if you play through the first two stages, that's the scrolling level and the shoot 'em up level, and complete a planet, you've more or less seen the rest of the game. It doesn't change. A potentially good game then, but it fails to draw you in after the first few planets. This is Asteroids RX by HiRise, written in 2021. You know what to expect with this game because of the name, but what you won't expect is such a brilliant game that it's almost arcade perfect. Many other Asteroids clones fall way short. See my shootout in episode 3 to prove that. Here though, you could almost believe this was an emulator. A bit like the Space Invaders or Pac-Man emulator you can get for the Spectrum. It isn't though, it's a very cleverly coded game that looks, sounds and plays superbly. I'm sure you know the game, destroy the asteroids and avoid being destroyed, simple. You can rotate left and right, thrust and use hyperspace to jump to a safe area on screen if things get too busy for you. The graphics mimic the vectors of the arcade game and are very smooth. It's really impressive how good this game looks. Sound is used really well too, making use of the AY chip to produce some excellent effects. Controls are definable and overall this is an excellent game. It also has one more trick up its sleeve, and that is you can change the colour of the game. This can be done in the main menu, or even during gameplay. So if you wanted red asteroids, it's easy. Just press enter to cycle through the Spectrum's colours. Overall, a brilliant game. And as an early arcade lover, this fits the build perfectly. Okay, back with Alan, and you've just seen the review of Asteroids that you've done. Yeah, thanks so much for covering that. I, it's I really a fantastic it. game, so I'd, I'd like to get a bit of information about the game because it's it's very close to the arcade. You must have played the arcade a lot to get it that close. A fair bit, I suppose, over the last 30, 40 years or whatever it is. So it's, uh... When did you decide to do it? I mean, was it, was it... I know you said before in our talks that the old arcade games have not been converted as well as they, they could have done uh, with modern techniques. So was it... Or did you just like Asteroids? Well, it's a, it's a little bit of both, actually, because um, I remember when we had that chat and we had a couple of comments where people said, well, it's all very well talking, why don't you do a game? And I thought, well, that's fair enough. And I also remember your sort of arcade shootouts. And I remember you did one on Asteroids and you said at the time, uh, there still isn't a good version of Asteroids for the Spectrum. Well, the, the, the problem was it's, it's a vector game, isn't it? So, And the Spectrum yeah, can't yeah. do vectors to any grip. I took pity on you, Paul, and I thought, OK, Marvellous. let's do it. <laughs> so were you going to try vectors at first, or did you, you always always plan to use sprite-based? Oh, oh, no. No, absolutely. I, I, I had no plan whatsoever to do it with vectors. I, I, uh, what I realised is, OK, so the Spectrum can't do the vectors, but what it does have an advantage over the let's say the original arcade board is a lot more memory those arcade games normally had uh, something like 8k yeah, maybe, 8K something, ROMs like that. Usually, yeah. Some, something like that so obviously um we don't need a lot of graphics we don't need a lot of uh, sound effects all these kind of things that means theoretically we've got an extra 40k or so that we could use so i figured well if we can use that to use kind of like lookup tables and do all the shifts for the graphics then it means that you could do something a lot faster by basically filling up the memory you remember when we had that conversation i said a lot of these games were written for 16k mm, and yeah. 
Um, later on, by the time the 48K re was really established, people had moved on from these games. And it's, it's funny, really, but in, in 1985, nobody wanted a game from 1979. 40 years later, people are happy to, to, to play one. Yeah, so, so where did you start? Did you start with the asteroid movement, or did you start with the ship rotation? You know what? No, well, well, there were two things. Firstly, I, firstly, I wanted to see how the ship would feel, mm. right? Because it's a smaller screen, and I really wanted it to be, you know, absolutely smooth. So it means that the entire time that you play the game, the ship is only ever moving one pixel at a time, right? So there's no jumps, there's no jerkiness. It's as as smooth as it could possibly be. Now that did mean that the ship was a little bit slower than in the arcade. Mm. But at the same time, um, the screen is a little bit smaller, so it kind of, I guess it balances out. Yeah. You know? But I, I'm still tweaking it, actually. I'm still... Right. So that's not the finished version that I've just reviewed, then? No, 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 no. You've got a, a preview oh, copy, right. and it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's... I'm adding some new features, and I'm, I have a, a little sort of group of people that support me on Patreon. They'll give me the time to do the coding that I, that I do. Yeah, so I'd, I'd made a little shoot 'em up game with a ship, like a little vector ship. It was moving around pretty fast. I like that idea. And so the next thing I thought was, well, if we're going to do this right, you've got to have a decent amount of asteroids moving around on the screen at once. So that was the main priority. You've got the, the raster bar, which is cycling around at uh, 50 times a second. So you've got to, to, in order for it to be smooth, you've got to update things very quickly. And at the same time, you've got a lot of things to update. So to make it work, you'd have to make sure that you had the plan to say, let's make sure we can have at least six big asteroids, which makes 12 small, medium, and then that would be 24 yeah. small yeah. ones, right? The arcade has more than that. I think it has 32 maybe. But given the, the size of the screen, I thought that's probably enough. And I gave it a go. And indeed, six is enough. So once I did that, and I knew that I had the engine, and I and I, I did it as I said with a lot of lookup tables, a lot of you know the player ship. That's a little tiny sort of eight by eight pixel ship, but it's got sixteen rotations, and it also has eight different positions. So just that ship itself is two K. So the number of iterations is one hundred twenty eight different uh, iterations of the ship in order to make sure that that's what makes it that's what makes it smooth, and that's really the essence of it. So the two things, one getting all the asteroids to, to be on screen at once, quickly and, and efficiently. And secondly, having the ship to be kind of super smooth. Having the player run really smoothly was, was really the key to the feel of it. And that was great. And then I did the same thing with the particle engine that could sort of do the little explosions and the bullets and, and all of that stuff. It uses a, a system where the draw and the undraw use the same routine and you record you record the memory address of what you've drawn so that you don't need to recalculate it but yeah i'm pretty happy with the result it, it doesn't even really feel like a spectrum game no it's it's it's, it's it is you know. an absolute cracking game and like you say it, it doesn't feel like a spectrum game the spirit of asteroids is, yeah. is in there yeah. you know that's really, really and, and of course it's part of your rx series of games which we'll be talking about yes. next episode but for now, uh, thank you very much for creating that game. It's a fantastic game, and I'm sure people will love it when it's done. Absolutely, yeah, my pleasure. I love, love to make games for people to have fun. Hello, and today we're going to look at Cow Dragon The Next Generation by Defecto Corp. Cow Dragon is a JRPG and it's a beautifully presented game with a nice manual that explains the backstory and how various elements of the game work. At the start of the game you get to choose between being a boy or a girl, which I always like, it's nice to have a bit of diversity in these games. You then have to answer a series of questions and your answers to these questions determine how the game will proceed, although there isn't much information at the start on what those differences may be. In keeping with the JRPG style, at the start of the game you're woken up by your grandmother who asks you to come to her so she can give you a quest. And what you find as you play the game is you quickly clock up plenty of these quests to be completed, you've got to do various things to progress in the game. One thing I found was that these quests were quite involved, most have several steps, it's not as easy as find object A and take it to person or place B and use it, you normally have to do that several times just to complete a quest. 
and they really get you thinking. You have to really think about some of the quests and how to do them. I really like this mechanic, it's really good, and it gives the game more of an old school adventure than your usual hack and slash RPG. As you play the game, you also quickly start to collect items, some of which you can equip. One thing I will say is it took me a while to figure out the equipment screen where you have to select the slot you want to equip with up and down, then use left and right to select what you want to equip, then finally use the select key to select it. I did find that a little bit fiddly, but once you get the hang of it, it's fine. One criticism is that that isn't explained in the manual, so it's a bit of a barrier to people just starting off the game for the first time. Two things that really stand out in this game are the music and the combat. There are some really good renditions of classic tunes, including Moonlight Sonata. I'm a big fan of Moonlight Sonata, and even included a version in my next game, but this is a much better version than mine. Combat isn't just your usual hack and slash, you take a turn and try and hit, they take a turn and try and hit. There are three forms of combat. Rock, paper and scissors. Rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock, and insult combat. Rock, paper, scissors is the classic game that I'm sure you all know. Rock, paper, scissors, lizard, Spock is an extension of that, just a more complex version, adding a couple of more choices. Insult combat is my favourite, and is very reminiscent of the combat in Monkey Island, where you have to choose the correct response to an insult to hit your opponent. I really, really like doing insult combat on this, it's really, really good, and there's some very amusing insults and responses. One thing that's a constant in the game is the need for food. You quickly start to starve if you don't keep topping up your food. You have to raid houses, including your grandmother's, to get as much food as possible. If you starve to death, then it's game over. The game gives you the tip that you should only eat when you really need to to conserve food. This is a good tip, so take heed. Now, I really like RPGs. I'm sure everyone knows that. I'm a big fan of games from back in the day, such as Bard's Tale. Love JRPGs as well. I remember playing Chrono Trigger for hours and hours and hours. In fact, I've pretty much been late getting this review to Paul because I've spent so many hours playing this game. Now I've written an RPG so I know how much work goes into it and there's obviously a lot of time and passion and love gone into this game. The graphics are great, the story's really really good and tongue in cheek and quite funny at times. And sometimes when you're playing this kind of game where you've got to solve puzzles you think oh I'm lost I don't know what to do next and I never really got that feeling with this game. Although who knows as I get towards the end because I haven't completed it yet I might. One small criticism is I have had the game crash on me once. I was playing in C-Spec, it runs fine in C-Spec by the way, and I've promised the author if it happens again I will send him some information to try and help him debug it. So summing up, this is an unusual and interesting take on classic JRPGs. The combat system alone makes it stand out, but the rest of the game makes it stand out as well. It may not appeal to anyone, I know some people don't like RPGs, they like shooters or platform games, but if you're looking for something different to the usual shooter or platform games that you get on the next, then this is well worth picking up. It's a beautiful game, I'm really enjoying it and I will continue to enjoy it. So that's Cow Dragon. Until next time, happy gaming! This is Road Racers, released by Arctic Computing in 1983, and it has a nice early Arctic inlay. Road Racers is a version of the arcade drive and dodge game Rally X. You control your car around a scrolling maze and collect flags while dodging the chasing cars. With this being a 16k game, some elements of the arcade are missing. For example, you have no option to deploy smoke screens to get rid of the chasing cars. A vital element of the game, I think.
There are also no rocks on the track, at least that's what I thought, as they are not mentioned in the instructions and I couldn't find them anywhere, however they do appear on level 2 and onwards. You get a fuel meter though, and have to collect all the flags before it runs out. There's also a radar showing the position of the flags and chasing cars. The maze scrolls in character squares, but this is fine for this style of game, and the sound just consists of the engine noise. The controls are just left and right, no option to change direction, so crashes are frequent, at least they were for me. The car will turn corners on its own, leaving you to just pick when and where you want to change direction. It's not a bad little game this, I liked it, and it's one of Arctic's games that I had not played before, even being a big Arctic fan, I'd never tried this one. There are other versions of this arcade game, the best one being Maze Death Rally X, released in 2018, but this one is certainly worth playing.